for you here. And I'm going to throw folks on mute here. Uh, oh, before I do that, uh, do we have anybody that's uh, new? I see Ron came back from last week, so we didn't scare him away. So that's great. Okay, let me mute everybody here. And everybody's familiar with the drill by now. If you have questions, throw them in the chat. And if there's anything super urgent, Carol will come down the hall and let me know. But uh, appreciate joining. We're going to be talking about the second half of the international area. Uh, the fair, as we discussed last week, had quite a few pavilions that were done by companies or countries overseas. And we'll see uh, in the very first one a, a combination. So let me uh, come up here with the share screen, find the picture. OK, so the first one we're going to look at today is Malaysia. Uh, it, um, should be full screen for everybody. Malaysia was a very modern looking pavilion trying to present the fact it was a modern island nation. And it was kind of tucked away in a corner. You can see uh, uh, other international ones around there, but it didn't get a lot of attention, but it was uh, very aesthetically pleasing. Just the kind of interesting view for all of us that like silly things. This is the only picture I can think I found of this particular little cart going around. This one guy is very proud. He has a Cushman scooter that he got uh, from the fair, restored it, and takes a cushy, as he calls it, to events. So maybe someday Golfy here will show up at another one. Um, inside the pavilion, you had all sorts of displays about uh, what Malaysia could offer to you in terms of the industry. We saw here that it was the world's lar uh, largest consumer of tin uh, for the United States. They uh, grew pineapples. They did all sorts of things. They showed how they did metalwork, fabric, all sorts of different things that you could get sourced over there, made over there because labor is so cheap. Uh, different it, displays of craft work, things you could do. And this one I thought was interesting. It shows how an American company, Colgate Palmolive, was part of uh, Malaysia, one of the big in investors over there. So they did a display for a, a name that people would recognize and kind of show them why you'd want to go off and participate over in Malaysia. Interesting thing about the Malaysian Pavilion, after the fair, it was bought by a college and picked up and moved to Plano, Texas, and um, was there for a number of years. And I, I found an old newspaper article and went to look to see if it still existed, went to Google Maps, no sign of it. And researching further, it turned out the college went out of business and they threw out all their records and the state of Texas was real mad at them because now people come by and they said, I got a degree from whatever the University of uh, you know Don Lancaster, and there's no records to prove whether people have degrees or not. So it's really unfortunate because I wanted to prove to the NASA people on the call about my three PhDs, and I, I can't find any records of it now. Going down again, we had a combination of international pavilions and religious pavilions. As I mentioned last week, Robert Moses gave away uh, free rent to religious organizations to start filling out some of the empty holes in the fair. Uh, the Masons built this pavilion, uh, lots of their symbols. I don't know them all, not being a Mason. But this arch, when we do next week the fair at night, this was really spectacularly uh, lit at, at night. Uh, just another uh, view of the area, trying to get more of the arch into it. And we go inside. They had displays of all the lodges from around the country, lodges around the world. Uh, thing about George Washington, famous Mason. They later recast the statue, and it's now in the park today, uh, cast in metal. This was a plaster sculpting of it, uh, but it's been recast and put on permanent display in the park today as a, a gift from the Mason. Mexico had a really, really prominent uh, position at the fair, a uh, very striking pavilion right at the Unisphere, so a very prominent location and a very popular one. They had a stage outside that uh, became uh, quite crowded for many of their shows. You had live musicians like we see here. You had a guy doing rope tricks. You had dancers of all sorts. But the major thing was you had the Waladori's um, acrobats that would climb up this pole, go all the way up to the top there. And then the pole was the, the structure at the top would start swinging around and they would be coming down, hanging from their feet and going faster and faster as they came down to the ground. They became one of the hits at San Antonio's Hemisphere 68 just a few years later. And the group still does perform and can be seen uh, today. This gives you an idea of how popular it might be. It's a little bit of a, uh, a trick image because it's the last day of the fair. 
uh, closing day, and it's the, one of the last uh, performances of the Voladores. So the crowd has come out uh, quite intent to see as much as they can. But uh, this is always proof why my parents didn't let me go to the fair on the last day. They were convinced I would never have made it home alive. But you can see how many people enthralled by their, uh, their performance. Inside, they had all sorts of uh, artwork from the uh, pre-Columbian days, uh, different dynasties. Uh, I have information of where some of these pieces, what years they were shown from. You had musicians up, up on the balcony performing to keep people uh, entertained. Lots of things on the fact that uh, Mexico has a rich cultural history, but it's also a modern industrial nation. In the background, you can see they were turning up record players, radios, TVs, refrigerators, all sorts of things down there. Again, another view of uh, the industrial part of it. They also had three restaurants that were popular, and it's today interesting, of course, you know, Mexican food very widely accepted. But back in 64, again, people tended to eat the food of the, the nation that their family was originally from. And there weren't a lot of restaurants to go to that serve, you know, quote, international, unquote, food. So they had three different restaurants in Mexico uh, that served a variety of food. Uh, Mexico, of course, being a huge nation, has food of different types, just like Italy. Not all Italian food is exactly the same. Well, not all Mexican food is the same. So the different restaurants work from the different regions of the country. They also worked on different budget uh, levels that were people uh, able to go into, very popular. Morocco, just down the road, another popular pavilion for its restaurant. That better not be for my car warranty. They've already called today. Goodbye. Um, again, we're gonna look at, go inside Morocco, uh, taking a nice walk inside the archway. They had all sorts of street art to uh, entertain. Uh, this fellow is doing some fire breathing. They had a fellow do a tray dance inside. This is at the indoor restaurant. They both had an indoor restaurant and an outdoor patio service. They later on ended up putting a tea tent out back and snack bars. They did everything they could because whatever they were doing, the food was so popular, the restaurants were constantly full. So by expanding and expanding and expanding to every inch of space, they were able to maximize the revenue and it became a financially successful venture for them. This is one of the stands, they had a bizarre type uh, setting in the center. You could buy these metal trays, you could buy the chairs, you could buy the rugs, you could buy basically anything that wasn't nailed down and they would be happy to ship it to you at your house. You didn't have to carry it uh, with you throughout the fair. Going down the road to Pakistan, aerial view here taken from the uh, New York State to the UNC Pakistan, uh, it was back there down at the six o'clock position. Uh, over to the left from last week, we were at Africa. We'll see Sweden, the blue building over to the right. But uh, just give me an idea of how varied all the things were in the international area. Striking little pavilion. Again, they started having success with their pavilions. So they started putting more pavilion space outside, putting these little restaurants, snack bars, and everything scattered around uh, outside. It turned out a lot of people did not necessarily want to go and take the time for a sit-down restaurant uh, meal because of the time involved, but they might enjoy your food. So if you started putting out things that people could grab real quick from outside, putting out snack bars, you had both uh, bases covered. People that had time and money could go to the higher priced restaurants. People with families or wanted to see more of the fair, they could grab something quick and it became a win-win. Again, some more pictures just of the snack bar. I got a kick here. Almost every picture of the doorman for the uh, uh, Pakistan Pavilion, he's scowling. And it's not just that this fellow was an unhappy guy and didn't like his job because I've got, probably got four different doormen and they're all scowling and looking fierce. And maybe that was part of the job requirements that you're supposed to be a fierce warrior keeping folks uh, out from the pavilion. But again, we can see a little bit of the uh, menu for the snack bar. You can get some sandwiches, a, a platter, some uh, Pakistani desserts and beverages. And again, the uh, restaurants in a lot of these are really, really popular because if you grew up like I did in Brooklyn, we were out on uh, South Shore of Long Island by this point in time, there were absolutely zero Pakistani restaurants or Moroccan restaurants or anywhere to go. So if you wanted to go and try something different, this was the uh, great part of the fair. This is interesting. This is the Paris Pavilion, and you certainly wouldn't know it looking at it because when they built their pavilion, they kind of left any signage off. 
Originally, it was supposed to be the Pavilion of France, and uh, they did a, a big groundbreaking ceremony, a very fancy booklet that they put out with a spectacular looking uh, pavilion. Then they realized they didn't have the money to actually build it once they had started, and Paris, uh, the, the country of France, pulled out, again, with BIE pressure for it. So folks stepped in and said, let's be the city of Paris, and they built this building, which is pretty much a prefab warehouse type structure. Matter of fact, after the fair, it ended up in Connecticut being exactly that. But they built it, and for those of us that have been in the theme park business, you realize you have to have, you know, what Walt would, uh, you know, talk about you know, having to have a uh, uh, weenie to draw people in. Well, they built the pavilion, and you have no idea whatsoever was in here. So over time, they started putting up different uh, signage, like here you can see nothing. Here they put the sign of Paris on there to get you some interest on it. Now they took out that wooden structure, they put in flagpoles, they put up more signs, they put up, uh, throughout the fair, they kept changing the signage to get people to come in. Unfortunately, there wasn't a big reason to go inside. Uh, by the way, it was a really big pavilion, uh, again, from the New York State Pavilion, but all that blue and white striped structure over there to the right is the Paris Pavilion. And they never ended up filling up most of the pavilion. A lot of it sat empty for the uh, period of the fair. This gives you an idea, a little flyer from it, the uh, world of exciting art. You can come in and you can see artists at work uh, and you can buy all these cool paintings that were uh, from $5 to $75, none price higher. Uh, whether or not they had any connection by actually being painted in Paris, you could take your guess on that. But you could go in, you get, get your portraits done and you can see just how spectacular the decor was here with inside uh, Paris. You wanted to make a, uh, an antique looking wall, so you painted the bricks on the wall. It was uh, not a big success. What really surprised me is it was actually there both years that whatever amount of money they made to keep the lights on in the first year, it was worthwhile to come back the second year. I would have predicted that this would have been one of the ones that had failed and didn't reopen, but it was there both years. This is one that's a real interesting history. It was the Pavilion of Argentina. Argentina built a pavilion and then again BIE pressure they decided to back out also they decided they didn't have the money to operate it so right before the fair is ready to open you've got this brilliant looking building and what are we going to do with it so the fair corporation went out and urgently got an art collection together and put it as a pavilion of uh, fine arts uh, didn't no, next to no publicity no signage wasn't in guidebooks and everything so you can imagine they didn't get a lot of uh, foot traffic going in there so the second year, it became the Bar Green Buffet. A Canadian company came and said, we'll take it over, totally gutted it from an art gallery and put in a, a, a food venue. This picture is blurry because it was taken, somebody moved the camera, but you can get an idea of just how large the buffet area was inside. Buffet set off to the left, tables all over the place, and it was a fairly economical uh, place to eat. And one of the things they did was they offered food from around the world because again, 64 had shown that international food was a big draw at the fair. So rather than just come in here and have just Canadian food, they had stations where you could get different entrees and that from uh, around the world. You could also go outside to the amazingly uh, enticing uh, ambience of the picnic tables that they put outside. And again, inside was such a success that if you had this area outside, let's put some, uh, some tables out there. It was not uh, something that I thought was particularly eye-catching. What eye catching though was uh, this one was really a beautiful pavilion, uh, Philippines. It was done after a traditional hat that the workers would wear out in the uh, fields. Most of the pavilion was upstairs uh, with a large open area underneath. So it was a very interesting uh, design that they did. And you can see more of it here. So down below you have some uh, structures, uh, some staircase to go up. But uh, basically booths and artwork down below, but the major displays uh, were shown upstairs in air conditioned comfort. Down below, you had all sorts of performances. Uh, you had military bands, all sorts of Filipino groups would come out, beauty shows, singers. Uh, this particular one, they're having a dance performance going by and a military honor guard going in the back. And somebody uh, was coming out to speak about the US and Philippine military ties. They had all these large wood panels that were carved in uh, the Philippines and brought over. Uh, they were uh, detailing history and the, uh, the uh, time of the Philippines. 
after the fair ended, the guy that was tasked with destroying the uh, uh, pavilion, he had the uh, demolition contract, was so taken by these wood panels, he took them home and had them installed in his estate, which is up on the North Shore of Long Island. It came up for sale for about four or five years ago. And it turned out he has a massive amount of uh, stuff from the fair, metal railings from this pavilion, uh, benches from this pavilion and everything. But it's really gratifying to know that these beautiful car panels still exist today. Uh, if you had several million dollars, you could go buy the house up on Long Island. A more modern looking display, again, all the different woods that were done in the uh, Philippines. It was done both for artistic purposes, but also remind people of the resources the Philippines had to offer. Then you could go upstairs and you could take a, a nice look. And this is a, a lounge area, lots of things about Philippine history. But again, most of these things were done by companies. The Philippine Pavilion was no exception. So why you would come over and you start investing and in getting things in the Philippines? One of the hosts is up there. Down below, they had a Philippine jeepney. Uh, explaining to people uh, what the difference is between a jeep and a jeepney. They, they took a lot of the vehicles from World War II, uh, you know, ran them as jeeps. And after they started warring out, they started building their own uh, jeepneys to uh, be more versatile, slightly larger than a World War II jeep. Second year of the fair, they ended up with a snack patio because again, everybody was enjoying international food so much. And I got a kick on this one. You could get your uh, chicken, uh, beef roll, uh, uh, fried lumpa, some of these things, I don't even know what they were. But uh, we mentioned the other day about uh, a span that had Caribbean flavored ices. Well, here you had Philippine ices. You could get a banana ice, a chocolate ice, a cherry ice, a, you know, a, a lemon, lime, all sorts of things. So very popular. And of course, hamburgers and hot dogs, the traditional foods of the Philippines. Here's another picture of the snack bar itself. And again, some more of the uh, prices. Again, every, most things were 99 cents, but if you're on a budget for 30 cents, you can still get a genuine hot dog. Polynesian restaurant was a little bit nicer upscale than uh, the hot dogs or hamburgers. Uh, you could sit outside under these uh, umbrellas that were done uh, in thatch things or they had a sit down restaurant inside. And of course, as the fair went on, you, everybody had to have waffles. So in, you could get a, Bel a Belgian waffle, which was a waffle with strawberry on it, or you get a Polynesian waffle, which was a waffle with strawberry on it. But they also had pineapple or peach to make it more interesting. So uh, waffles everywhere. I don't think I've ever had a Polynesian waffle, but uh, I don't know if I could tell the difference between their strawberry version or somebody else's. This one's kind of interesting. This uh, wooden fellow here was outside the uh, entranceway and nothing here again to particularly tell you uh, who he is or why he's there. Uh, so he's just standing there. They decide to come up and put a big uh, sign across his crotch telling you that he's Polynesia. And as time went on, they also said, hey, we get more interest if we also blew giant flames out of his head. Uh, after the ferry, he was bought, moved up to uh, Lake George, New York, where uh, carpenters like to go, Carol and I like to go as well. And he uh, went up to the theme park there outside of uh, Lake George in their, uh, their jungle type area. This was the main attraction though at Polynesia. Besides the restaurant, you had the stage area. We're looking down from the Swiss Sky Ride. Uh, you had a uh, small stage out in the middle of the fountain area and uh, a little uh, outrigger canoe is just barely visible over the awning down at the bottom left. The performers would go out and do their, their dancing out there. Underneath the awning, she also had a, uh, a lot of dancers who would come out and perform. So here you're, the, the entertainers are getting ready for their, their time. You can come up and get your pearl oysters and make sure that uh, you can get some pearl jewelry, take that home with you. Uh, or you can come out and get entertained by Polynesian music, Polynesian dancers, and big spectacular thing, the Polynesian fire show. So uh, these guys have come out several times a day, do the show, very popular. Uh, this was all done for a entertainment admission charge. Uh, and that's how these pavilions managed to, uh, to keep the lights on, keep things going. Another pavilion that's very much of interest, uh, like so many of the others, was built in China and then brought here reassembled. China for the 64 World's Fair was the Republic of China, which is Formosa or Taiwan. 
Mainland China did not participate in any of these fairs. I think the first one they may have done was Expo 86. But again, this was all built in China and brought over here and reassembled. Very striking pavilion, great location right facing the uh, Unisphere. Matter of fact, here's a picture from the balcony up there looking out into the, uh, the general court area of the Unisphere, New York State Pavilion over to the left. But you can see for their uh, dinners, if you went and had dinner at this particular restaurant and get a table by the window, what a spectacular view you had as you were uh, being entertained. Great intricate artwork, all put together a combination of carved wood, gilded uh, wood, uh, tile work, ceramics, things brought over and assembled. And we're going to go in. The, the restaurant looks like it's closed, but don't worry, I made reservations for everybody. So we're going to go in, uh, go in and have this brilliant. Uh, design of the phoenix inside. There were uh, displays inside, but the major thing in the Chinese restaurant, on the China Pavilion was the Chinese restaurant was very popular. Hostess here is ready to take us to our table. And again, the Taiwan uh, flag, not the uh, net, you know, red China's flag. And this is just an example of what was inside the pavilion. Uh, all sorts of artwork up on the walls. Uh, there's a little uh, thing down below uh, where it's telling you uh, the catalog number, the prices, the sizes. If you happen to want to go and buy uh, any of these, you could. One of the things that's interesting is after the pavilion was removed at the end of the fair, somebody had the sense to take the ceiling, which was all made of panels like this, and break them into individual panels. And I haven't seen one for about three years or so, but they used to show up on eBay fairly often. And a number of collectors have pieces of the uh, China pavilion. Different hostesses that would take you around to talk about the industrial displays or uh, just the tourism opportunities that are coming to Formosa. Lots of displays on the history. This is again a, a section there of, of a combination of history and also uh, materials and things that you could buy over there. So these may look ancient, but they were all modern things uh, showing things that the, the local craftsmen could turn out for you. They did have uh, ancient things on display. I forget the name of the dynasty that this was from, but it's way, way older than the United States is for sure. Korea, again, South Korea, they didn't proclaim themselves as South Korea because they refused to admit that the country had been split in half. So it was just the Korean pavilion, Republic of Korea, uh, as opposed to South Korea. But again, a striking view. We're looking down at it from the, uh, the skyway down below the uh, Family phone booths, people lined up and staring at strangers, making speaker phone calls off to their family. Hostess inside coming and uh, giving tours. Uh, matter of fact, the hostesses for the Korean pavilion were outside in the patio gardens a lot posing for people uh, because the costumes were just so striking. Silk robes and a lot of the accessories went on them, so they became very popular. Also, this particular time of year, you can see all the trees were flowering. It was a beautiful time for amateur photography. Inside, they had displays, like, again, most of the others of uh, different parts of the culture, how they did flower arrangements, things along that line. Uh, traditional costumes from a Korean uh, wedding. Uh, so a little bit blurry, this sign, but it captures uh, what's going to be in the next picture talking about the history of the uh, uh, country and what this particular type of pagoda is and explaining again part of uh, what the religion and the uh, religious and historical symbolism was. Outside they had a restaurant. You can see the brass rail back there. Um, it kind of might be mid-fair because it's getting kind of dingy in that. But I mentioned before some of the brass rails were nicer than others. So down below you had the traditional snack bar part underneath the uh, uh, the balloons, but then you had a more a nicer restaurant, Korea House, off here to the uh, the side. Uh, we have the obligatory picture of a, uh, a gift shop, and we're going to head from there to another religious pavilion, Sermons from Science. You walk up to this and you say, "Wow, Sermons from Science! Uh, I love going to church every Sunday and getting a sermon. Science is just so exciting. Yeah, I think I'll spend my time at the fair getting a sermon." So. Um, Again, I appeal is everything. So let's go and take the rather bland pavilion. And let's put a bunch of pictures on it, make it much more attractive and try to get people to come and see. We, I have to go see this because it's internationally acclaimed. 
For folks that aren't familiar with it, Sermons from Science has been back at World's Fair since at least the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. And they have a, uh, a whole stage show that they put together. We've got a picture here of it where a uh, fellow will go in and put a huge amount of uh, voltage through his hands and ignite a piece of paper that is in his hand from an electrical charge that's coming in from his foot, that sort of thing. And the basic uh, philosophy is that uh, God must uh, believe in science uh, or none of these things would work that I'm going to do to you that it's all tied into the master creation of the universe. Uh, after this fair, they ended up taking the same display, the same people up to Expo 67. They've been in a number of uh, others. Kind of a plain looking pavilion here. This is Sierra Leone. Uh, it's actually interesting. The fair is open at this point, but the pavilion was not. You can see a bunch of crates still stacked up in front that they were urgently working to get the pavilion done. When the fair opened on uh, opening day in uh, 1964, there were a number of them that weren't quite done. And you can see some of them were ran a couple days, some of them a couple weeks. As we discussed last week, the Belgian village ran a couple months. But this was a uh, interesting one that uh, they, they built it. I have not been to this country, but it's supposed to represent the mountainous nature of the country. Uh, they had performers that come in and do dancing. Uh, they had the musicians who would perform outside. Uh, I really get a kick out of the guy with a cigarette here because it's just, you know, from the show element, not the best. Turned out the uh, people that were the backers of this pavilion uh, did not have the money to keep it running well and operating. The people that lived in the pavilion or worked in the pavilion, rather, uh, did not have the money to pay their rent. So a lot of them ended up moving into the pavilion and trying to hide out there and live there during the time of the World's Fair. This was a, a wood sculpture out back. So uh, they were left in really destitute times. They didn't have the money to make it home. They didn't have the money to stay in New York. So, uh, and the fair did not want them living uh, at the, uh, the pavilion at night. So that they eventually did find an alternative uh, accommodations. So it became a real mess because the backers brought them over here and basically abandoned them. So it did not return in 1964. Hopefully the people did get home, but it returned as the pavilion in the United Nations. Got a new paint scheme in the traditional UN blue. They put a, a restaurant inside. Again, the idea of international food. So this, since this was the United Nations, they had food from around the world uh, all served there at their particular place. Much more colorful, a lot more uh, eye appealing than it had been in 1964. You turn to one of the real jewels of the fair, the uh, Spain Pavilion, massive pavilion, which still is, is that rectangular set of uh, buildings all in the center. The country of Spain uh, ignored the BIE uh, prohibition on uh, exhibiting at the fair. They decided they were going to be there and they went all out. They got uh, name brand designers, or just, uh, architects to build the pavilion. They brought in a tremendous amount of artwork from Spain, uh, both new and uh, antique pieces. They brought in performers. They really went all out uh, for this particular pavilion. So again, pretty striking uh, look, very modern. Uh, they were trying to present again the image of Spain as a country on the up and uh, cutting edge of everything. Come on and see us. Oh, sorry, that went by real quick. Quick view across the fountains there. I just like this one again with the fountains of the fair jutting, Spain in the background, and we'll see more of those posters that they inside the, the pavilion. But a very eye-catching pavilion. There's the rocket thrower off to the right there. Uh, and again, some of the painting or posters they had outside about uh, contemporary art of Spain, were they contemporary art, they had vintage art, they had modern dancers, so they had traditional dancers, they had all sorts of things that get you to come into Spain. Spain was such a large pavilion, it had a guidebook that it was looked very much like the official guidebook to the 64 fair. It had its own guidebook of uh, the exhibits at the uh, pavilion, very, very popular. Again, more pictures here at ballet, uh, flamenco dancers. Uh, they had all sorts of artists come in to do performances. Uh, they had a movie inside. They had uh, uh, poetry. You can see a sign back there about uh, Dolly. We'll see some of his artwork. It was really uh, what the most spectacular next to the uh, Vatican Pavilion of the international exhibits at the fair. Some of the dancers were from Spain, brought over here to perform. Uh, some of them were on tours of other museums and uh, arenas across the US. 
They also invited any Spanish groups that were from around the US to come to the Spain Pavilion and entertain. So you had all sorts of folk groups. You had uh, the woman here is passing a flyer, is telling you to make sure you come in and see the rest of the pavilion inside. You had dance troops of all different types doing all sorts of different dances. Uh, flamenco dance looking very dramatic there. You had a sculptor garden out back, Hernando de Soto, his sculpture out there. You also had uh, some uh, modern art you can see back by the curtains there. Uh, one of the, uh, looks like a monk or a friar there. This one was very hard to photograph, uh, Queen Isabella from Spain, because it was done in a very dark uh, sort of design and any sort of light behind it made it very hard to, uh, to get the features of it. So I do have pictures of it. It was best photographed in a gray and gloomy day, but uh, this was just kind of a nice one with all the colors of the flags on its side. Inside, they had all sorts of artifacts that were brought over, uh, very ornate uh, jacket worn bullfighting, the scepter that was given to Queen Isabella. Uh, this was a piece done by Dolly, a uh, cross, and this is another one, very intricate artwork that he did here. I forget the name of this one off the top of my head but uh, lots of stuff. After the fair, the pavilion was sold to the city of St. Louis, Missouri, brought back over, tried to operate there as a Spanish pavilion. The mayor of uh, St. Louis was from uh, Spanish heritage and tried to make it a gateway into his area. Uh, that eventually failed and this, the building was rebuilt into a hotel. Most of the brilliant artwork and everything has been since covered over and turned into a traditional hotel but the pavilion does still exist. For us Disney fans, you may recognize the name of Rebus. Uh, the Rebus brothers have been the traditional glass cutters at Disneyland and at uh, Walt Disney World doing all the etchings on Main Street. So you can go in and get your glass cut, put your name on it. Uh, they turned out millions and millions of you know, cut Mickeys and that sort of thing. But they came over here to the uh, uh, 64 World's Fair, very popular. Uh, for people getting stuff done again and uh, got quite a few pictures of him working away there. I got a kick out of here. They also brought over Spanish guards to guard the artwork. Uh, you had that sort of thing done in a couple places. Uh, the state of Alaska, for example, the state of Hawaii brought in state troopers, uh, kind of more of a publicity gimmick, but also to keep an eye on some of their things. And then they did the same thing with some of the international pavilions. So you can imagine what a great uh, deal this guy had for two years to come over and you know just talk to the uh, the, uh, the guests as they were coming in. Probably not a lot of chance people are actually going to steal much out of the pavilion. We're going to go down to Sudan. Again, a striking pavilion, very uh, very colorful. You see a bunch of Boy Scouts marching by off to the side there. Again, colors of the fair, uh, you got the Skyway. We'll be taking more of a look at the Skyway going on, but I just got a real kick out of how eye-catching this stuff was to, uh, to look at. Mentioned before earlier, if you have a restaurant, everybody doesn't want to spend time on it, but they might want to eat your food. So if you will compare it to say, here there's no snack bar and here there's a snack bar. So this is very, very uh, prominent or common during the time of the fair that these pavilions, as long as you had a kitchen, you were cooking everything anyway, you might as well bring stuff outside, sell it fast, and make some money on it. Exhibits inside, lots of things about the uh, uh, um, wildlife there in the area. And they also had wildlife outside. They had a zoo, which was kind of popular. These birds were very unique and not traditionally seen in New York. Uh, these guys were, I believe, called duckbills. During the winter in between the fair, they arranged that they would go out and uh, spend time under the uh, uh, care of the New York uh, Bronx Zoo, so they didn't have to take them all the way to Sudan or not uh, and back again. And I believe after the fair ended that they were uh, left in New York and uh, hopefully the descendants are still entertaining people at the, uh, the zoo today. We're going to take a look now at Sweden. I mentioned before uh, the uh, Paris off to the right. Sweden is a big blue and gold building down uh, seen from the New York uh, State Pavilion. And a little slightly closer view, kind of an interesting uh, shape of it for the plot of land that they had to fit on. They had the Tower of London mentioned last week in the National Plaza behind that. 
But Sweden, very modern, uh, very elegant, it was done in large part. Uh, the major uh, builder of it was a large department store chain in Sweden. Uh, they had a big catalog that you could buy anything from their Swedish department store and they would make sure it was delivered to you. Uh, Billion is not quite open this time of day, early morning, getting ready to go in, but very sharp, clean lines. Inside, lots of displays about how Sweden is a modern nation with industrial power. So a big thing on hydroelectric and how that was a, a, a big clean source of energy. Uh, all sorts of displays on how they take electricity and send it around from dams. So the difference between AC and DC current. Looking into the gift shop, again, done by the department store. You know, one of the big things they were selling was glassware. So all sorts of displays of glass you could get. And again, you could buy it here at the fair. You could carry it home with you, or they would be happy to ship it to you, or they would give you a catalog and you could buy any more of it that you wanted to at home. Kind of interesting ceiling display, just uh, breaking up the monotony of a tile ceiling. Outside is Canon, uh, just looks like a, a traditional Canon. There's nothing here to tell you anything about it in this early shot. Like in other things they realized over time, nobody knew why it was there or what it was there for. So they added a sign to it that was from the Vasa, a famous Swedish ship that sunk and uh, has been uh, since brought back up and restored. If you ever do get a chance to go in and see it, it's spectacular. I get a kick out of this picture. It looks like the guy got his head blown clean off by the cannon. So it's a good reason why you don't look into weapons. I'm gonna take a quick trip on the Swiss Sky Ride. This was a spectacular Sky Ride system. Uh, other places, you know, Disneyland has had the Sky Ride for a while. Uh, it became almost traditional in any sort of world's fairs. You had to have a monorail and a Sky Ride, but this was a really big system. Uh, it went, uh, you can see the Belgian village in the background and uh, we're gonna, the International Plaza is just over to the right. And the other side, you've got the uh, British Lion Pavilion, Singer Bowl and, and that. But in between, oh, this is a, a kind of interesting view. I got a kick here. We knew about, you had the Pepsi Pavilion, the Coca-Cola Pavilion, the 7-Up Pavilion. Well, here's the Diet Right Cola Pavilion, some vending machines stuck outside. But a big system went way high. Someone was mentioning online why they painted the towers red in 65. and uh, They thought they looked better white in 64. I did too. And I can't imagine why, because it had to be expensive to bring in the equipment and everything to paint these towers red for 65. No clue why somebody went and spent the time and money to do it. But you had some spectacular views from it. You also had these nice views of it going by. So nice. Zoom lens collapsing everything down with the fountains, the Unisphere, the New York State Pavilion, the Port Authority, the uh, Skyway, lots going on. But this is the sort of views you'd get from being up there. You can see how many uh, buckets they had going on this system at a, a point in time. Some days were very quiet, and that's the way basically they could start off. It was two completely different systems. Uh, four cables, so they could do the left or the right system and then start putting the number of buckets on it, depending on how busy the day was. So most days it was busy enough that they could run uh, all four, uh, you know, sides, both sides of it, four cables. But if you had a slow day or the weather was sort of inclement and people weren't going, you just run half the system. And it went way up there, very high, uh, great views. You can see Shea Stadium in the back. Indonesia down to the right, uh, uh, off to the left, the United States Pavilion. Just more views from up there. Uh, it was a wonderful way to spend a, a trip going across. As folks know, it can get kind of windy out of Flushing Meadows at times, so it gave you a certain pucker factor as you're up there and the thing was swaying from side to side. But this again shows you how high up this thing was and just how many of these buckets were up there at any point in time. Just more views going by. You could, if you had a good camera, you could get some pictures of other people taking pictures. This picture I got a real kick out. This is in the late 1965, uh, sorry, late 1964, getting ready to close for the season. Everybody coming out just to get one last view of the fair for the year. And you can see just how busy this uh, attraction was with paying customers. It turned to be a very profitable exhibit. After the fair, it was dismembered and you can still ride. Uh, and I think they've retired all the cars, but the towers can still seem over a great adventure in New Jersey. This one I got a kick out of just two kind of iconic symbols of the fair, the Skyway and one of the Eternal Food Arches. 
with the, uh, the Ferris logo, peace through understanding. Switzerland, uh, kind of interesting pavilion. You had a uh, restaurant in the back, a gift shop. And down below, you see the Swiss Time Center. This was the official uh, time center of the World's Fair. All the clocks were synchronized to it. A lot of people thought that this was the official real clock. No, this was a uh, clock that was synchronized to the uh, clocks in that Boosby we just saw. A closer view of it that was some like ceramic uh, symbols around there. But these clocks here, like the Swiss clock, there were about 12 of them scattered around the fairground. Uh, my uncle uh, Bill was in charge of the uh, New York telephone crew that wired all these back to the central clock and that little booth. And this is where I first started getting my interest in the fair because we'd be at family get togethers and Uncle Bill would be talking about, you know, uh, boy, you can't believe what they did today. They were just, you know, building this building, doing that thing, and uh, they're building this village and doing it. So he was all over the fair wiring up the payphone systems and the, uh, the, the clocks. And he had just talked so much about what he had seen that by the time the fair opened, we were real interested in, in going. And they had displays inside of Swiss watches. They had an official Swiss Miss watch of each year that you could uh, enter into the beauty contest and win and be pre uh, pre presented to the world as Miss Swiss watch. You also had a Swiss restaurant. You could get a nice fondue meal or other uh, Swiss entrees, very popular spot. Again, both an indoor restaurant and an outdoor patio that you could go and enjoy yourself at. And tables and that sort of stuff right over in Switzerland for a nice traditional feel. Thailand, super popular pavilion. Um, when I show you the uh, uh, two weeks now we're doing the building of the fair, lots of pictures is being built. This was uh, again built in Thailand, drilled, built right over here, put together. What you actually don't realize looking at this picture is the pavilion is basically a glass box with these uh, gold uh, covered pieces of wood over it. So you can see a lot of the glass panels behind it. They use so much gold leaf that they actually ran out of gold leaf all throughout the New York area. And uh, we'll see pictures two weeks uh, from now. At the very last minute, guys hanging from cranes trying to get gold up on the roof to finish the pavilion. But it was spectacular. Uh, the nighttime shots, which we'll see next week, uh, it's really very, very uh, wonderful lighting design that they did on it. But you had uh, this center building here, this pagoda type structure was about the history of the country. The lower building off to the left was uh, more on the history, but also on the uh, tourism and the economic uh, developments. And off to the right was a very popular restaurant. There were often very long lines to get into Thailand. Uh, again, it was kind of crowded to go inside and look at all the displays. Just to give you an idea of how ornate this uh, this particular pavilion was. It was a big hit. Uh, it turns out I have a number of pictures of artists that were uh, outside uh, doing pictures of it. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't think I have pictures of people doing artwork of say the General Motors or the uh, British Lion Pub, but people just love to come and do pictures of the, uh, the Thailand pavilion. Inside displays these mannequins with traditional costumes more of a closer picture of some of the uh, ornate headgear. Whoops. All sorts of uh, different things about the history, uh, the fact that they could make all these wonderful pieces for you if you're so inclined, closer view here. And again, this is all in that center pagoda, so a lot to see, and that's why it took a long time to get in and out because there was a lot to see in there. Uh, Picture of the royal family, portrait, their official portrait. And hostess is that again, just like what we saw over in Korea, they'd be glad to pose for you. Uh, if she's giving a tourism information, you could sign up, they'd be glad to send you brochures of it. Uh, they had postcards there about the, uh, the, the pavilion that you could get and fill them out, they would mail you more information. So again, lots of shots of the hostess is entertaining. They also did beauty shows outside. Uh, they again would bring people over from Thailand or they would do things from Thais who were living in the United States and invite to come and participate there at the, uh, the fair. Uh, by the way, after the fair, it ended up going up to Expo 67 in Montreal. It had been so popular in New York that they expanded it, made it even bigger, and it was just as successful up in uh, Montreal. 
Egypt went by two names, Egypt and also the United Arab Republic. That was a, uh, a thing they were trying to do with Syria uh, to try to, again, just like we saw last week with Central America, let's come up, combine our uh, economic might or manufacturing might, of course, common boundaries. Uh, the UAR did not last very long, so Egypt came and participated on their own without Syria. Again, uh, the same sort of thing happened. They were supposed to have a UAR presence at Expo 67, did not. In the very center of this pavilion, uh, entranceway, you can see a little white uh, sign there. It was come and put a, a, a card in a box and you can win a free trip to Egypt. Uh, scoured newspapers left and right, never found out if anybody ever did get a free trip to Egypt or not. But it was a very striking pavilion. Um, I've mentioned before that uh, one of my favorite uh, souvenirs from the fair was a piece of cotton that a hostess gave me from the fair the final week I had gone and uh, you know talking to her about her not wanting to go back home and just the memories that that, that provided. So um, modern line inside lots of things about Egypt and uh, its uh, its history and the Aswan Dam you know was being planned at that point in time but also uh, cotton and other crops that were being done. Big, big hit pavilion from the fair, particularly me, uh, people like me who were Catholic. It was a must-see, the Vatican Pavilion, seen from the New York State Pavilion with the Belgian village curving around behind it. Uh, this is a view, again, from the mezzanine level of the New York State Pavilion, looking at it. Uh, the Astral Fountain here, I thought people might get a kick out of it. I mentioned before it was windy a lot in Flushing Meadows. And you can see if you have a fountain jetting out a large stream of water and you have wind, what would happen? So that a lot of pictures in early 64, this particular quadrant was always wet. So they ended up installing a weather uh, station with a wind vane that would detect how high the wind was blowing and it would dial down the strength of the fountain accordingly. This one, again, and this one is, is dry. Uh, they dialed down, you can see the fountain is nowhere near as high because it's a windy day. If you look at the white panel on the Luminaire street light there, uh, you can see some writing on it. And it's interesting that it, if you can see the full resolution picture, basically says defective, be sure to replace. And they, you know, typical sort of thing. You tell people, don't put this out on the show area and it stayed out there and they put it out there and I don't think they ever replaced it, so. It just kind of, when I first saw it, I said, what is that writing? And it says, yeah, defective panel. But the uh, Vatican Pavilion, very, very popular, done by a uh, uh, combination of money from the Vatican, but mostly from Catholic churches across the United States. Uh, large contributions from the dioceses of New York, which arranged for it to be uh, held. This particular panel is uh, now up in Kennebunkport, Maine. We were up there a few years ago. It's on display in a monastery. It was a piece of modern Christian art commissioned for the fair. Uh, very popular, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, we'll see why in particular. In this particular day, Cardinal Cushing, who had been instrumental in getting the Pieta brought over to the fair and having the pavilion built, was going to be attending. So lots of people coming out to uh, listen to him speak. Uh, always thought if you had a summer job you didn't like, you probably liked it more than the fellow that had to dress up as a Swiss guard and sell guidebooks. But inside you had a, a Roman Catholic church, so he had a more modern looking altar than you'd seen at many uh, churches at the time. After the fair ended, the church uh, was taken apart and is now, most of it is in uh, Connecticut and is being used today as a Catholic church. So you had actual Catholic services being held here. Uh, every Sunday, and then uh, they would also uh, invite different priests to come in with their congregations and uh, celebrate. Uh, just some pictures of the modern art uh, design of the altar area, the ceiling of the uh, church, and again, this has been moved over to uh, Connecticut. Lots and lots of displays, some ancient, some new, some recreations of ancient things about the uh, important mo moments or people from Catholic history. Uh, pieces done by uh, Michelangelo. Uh, you can see that they made uh, no danger that people were going to be doing anything to some of these pieces. Two guards standing at this particular one. Uh, papal tiara that the, the uh, Pope had donated. Reproductions of things at the Sistine Chapel done uh, again with little placards explaining more about it. 
again, different things, different saints. Sometimes you had original uh, down in the glass case, there are original manu illustrated manuscripts. Uh, a bunch of nuns did these liturgical banners that were hanging up there. You had a pavilion gift shop. They sold stamps uh, that you could take home or you could fill out a postcard. They would take it back to the Vatican City and post it over there and send it back to you. But the piece de resistance was the Pieta. Uh, it was the uh, only time it's ever been displayed outside of the Vatican. Uh, mentioned before, it was brought over on an Italian ship. My dad worked for a competing shipyard uh, shipping company, and he actually consulted on how you get this thing over here safely. So it was done in a very spectacular setting um, on display. You had moving sidewalks that brought you in. Some at a very higher, well, not high. One was a little bit faster than the other. So if you were really, really just looking to see it get in and out, you could go and take the faster one. If you wanted to spend more time, you could do the uh, other one. But it was a very, very um, uh, moving display, very well lit. Uh, and again, very hard to get pictures of uh, from an amateur photographer because you're on a moving platform. Uh, with the film at the time, very hard to get a fast glimpse of it. I just thought this lighting was particularly uh, striking. Uh, again, a closer view. This was done, this is a professional souvenir slide taken not on, on the, uh, the moving slide. This also shows you why it's hard to get a picture of it. It was behind the giant plexiglass shield. So when you were shooting a picture, you had to get your, uh, take it at an angle that your light wasn't gonna come back at you. You also had to try to get your picture taken as early as you could during the day because uh, people would tend to touch the plexiglass and get all smudged and turn into a mess. So uh, this was a, a, a real challenge to get good pictures of it. Outside in 1965, they had this empty garden. So they decided to talk to you about Father Mendel and his theories on heredity. So if you had all these flowers grown and how you could uh, do different things with pure white flowers, pure red flowers, hybrid flowers, some that were uh, smooth flowers, wrinkled flowers, it was, uh, Great for an eye uh, eye opener, but it was not necessarily uh, you know uh, super educational. And we're getting near the end. WBT two thousand tribes, the Wycliffe Bible translators. Uh, they had found an indigenous tribe that had not heard anything about the teachings of uh, Christianity, and they decided that they would translate the Bible into that, and realized that each of these tribes had their own unique language. So they set off to translate the Bible into 2,000 different indigenous languages to make sure that everybody, whether you're in the jungles of uh, the, uh, you know, say Borneo, or if you're down in Africa, that uh, the, the teachings were available to everybody. They also had these uh, traditional um, uh, totem poles outside. Very interesting, the way that they uh, aligned them Almost every picture you would look at and think that there were two totem poles uh, for the little path that they had going up there. But if you look at it from a different angle, there were actually three of them. And uh, over time, they realized people were stepping on all the plants to go get their picture taken. So they actually decided to take advantage of it, put a little uh, concrete sidewalk up there with a little signage. So when you took your picture and you took it home, uh, you were reminded in the signage where you had uh, taken your picture. It was at WBT 2000. So that's it. Made it within the hour. Let me stop the share there. So I will unmute uh, folks. If, if you wave, if you hit the uh, raise hand button, uh, if you have a question, it pops up to the top corner of the screen and I see it quicker. If I see you physically waving your hand, I can try to see it as well. So Steve Crockett, I see you waving. So you can unmute yourself. You should be able to unmute yourself, Steve. One of the things I wanted to add go. in regard to the Swiss Skyride, I live in New Jersey, and the actual mechanical part of the Swiss Skyride is still at Great Adventure. So while you can't ride the cars, when you are riding the Skyride, it is the actual machinery that was used at the World's Fair is still there and still operates. And also I wanted to add that the for the first two years that Great Adventure was open in 74 and 75, the Greyhound tram cars uh, moved people from the parking lot to the main gate of Great Adventure. So you could have ridden those 74 and 75 before uh, Six Flags took over. 
I said, I knew the tram cars, a bunch of them ended up at the uh, Buffalo Fair. Uh, and a couple of years ago, they were trying to sell them and nobody could buy, you know, wanted to buy them. What do you do with them? So I didn't know any of them ended up over at uh, Great Adventure as well. Yeah, just for the first two years until uh, Six Flags took over in 76. Ah, that's interesting to know. Somebody asked in chat about Malaysia. Did they have uh, any way for a handicap? And, and basically, no. Most of the pavilions, people did not have uh, provisions for uh, handicap access back in 64. It was, uh, you know, just the, the ADA was not even a dream in people's eyes at that, that point in time. So some pavilions like the United States Pavilion had the massive staircase going up in the center, but they also put elevators in the one of the pylons to go in. But in many of the others, I'm trying to think, uh, Bell System did have an elevator uh, that I, I, I know because I remember riding it. Uh, but a lot of the others, if you were handicapped, you were just out of luck. Um, they, they did not make provisions for it, which is unfortunate. And uh, as a result, if you stop and think about it, I'm, I'm just reminiscing about all the pictures I have of the fair. You don't see an awful lot of pictures of people in wheelchairs, and I think probably for a, a good reason. Gary, you wanted to uh, say something? Let me unmute you here. Gary M. Here we go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I lost my picture. That's supposed to be the background. That's from the Sermons from Science show. Yeah. Uh, I was very intrigued by that. They had roughly six to eight different shows a day. But when they found out that this particular one with the electricity going through the man uh, was popular, they actually did more of those. So that maybe every second or every third show each day was that show. So where the others would get one a day, that might get three or four a day. Yeah, you know, um, I was well paid because, man, looking at that picture, that's scary. I, I do remember it. And, uh, you know, I, I also remember my mother being horrified by the thought that we might want to try one of these things at home. And you also mentioned uh, at the end with the uh, 2000 tribes, um, again, uh, I wasn't particularly religious, but for whatever reason, I went to that pavilion. It was free. There were no lines. It was a very small theater, literally a couple of benches. And uh, they showed you these gigantic paintings uh, roughly about 10 feet, 12 feet uh, wide uh, and gave you a little presentation and told you how they're trying to bring uh, uh, the gospel to people that uh, don't even have language at all. Um, and again, it was just something out of the way that uh, was a little bit different for the smaller pavilions. It says in the guidebook that they charged the first year I wouldn't have paid for it. I know it was free whenever I went. I went a number of times. Uh, same with sermons from science. Uh, I would always stop there because the lines <laughs> weren't that long for the show. So um, just two of the smaller pavilions that had an impact on me that I enjoyed checking out. Yeah, I, I went to it a couple of times in the second year when it was free because it was right next to Kodak. So uh, if you were up in the moon roof, you could look down and say, hey, there's no line, run over there and, and get online real quick. So it was a, was a great attraction. I had one more quick comment. Yeah, sure. Uh, you, you being a Disney uh, guy, um, I was at Disneyland maybe 20 years ago uh 2010 maybe 25 30 years maybe early 90s late 90s um they touted at the time that they had the only sky ride which i took which i was on that uh had a 45 degree angle turn on it do you recall that oh absolutely that was uh great you come over Go over the uh, uh, Autopia, go to the chain station, turn over to the uh, next uh, structure. It was always the poor guy that had to work in the middle there. Just keep <laughs> eye on to make sure it transferred okay. Right. Yeah, I missed the sky ride. I mean, uh, it was a it was a great uh, great attraction, and uh, uh, 
yeah, I, I don't recall if any others having a uh, an angle turn in a transfer station like that in them. If somebody's asking where in Connecticut, I assume Catherine, you're asking about the church. Um, is it New London that it's in? I'm trying to remember where. Uh, yes, New London. New London. Okay, I thought New London was... Groton near the near the submarine base. Right. Yeah, I, I worked at the submarine base. And I remember, you know, you look at something and go, yeah, it rings a bell. And then you don't think about it and realize that it really rang a bell because it was the, uh, you know, the, the real McCoy. So uh, it's very recognizable if you drive up to it to, to see it. And they will happily give you uh, tours of it and talk to you about it. Any other questions, comments? Uh, oh, Brent, and uh, by the way, I got your email after I sent out the invites and I'll add you to the, uh, the list. So you should be able to unmute yourself now. There you go. Okay, this is because somebody brought up uh, handicapped. My dad was a disabled World War II vet and we pushed him around the fair in a wheelchair. And the people at the pavilions were very good about bumping wheelchair people to the front of the line. So although we didn't have a whole lot of days at the fair, because we were staying with my uncle in Wilmington. Uh, we did get into um, places like the GM Pavilion. That taco that's in there quickly, so you can go back so what you want. Where, uh, you know, we would have had to wait for a long time in the line. I don't know how long, but it was really long uh, because the people there. They might not have had a lot of built-in facilities for handicapped people, but they were really good about helping handicapped people like my dad, who was using a wheelchair. It's nice that they did that. And it's, it's interesting, you know, how unfortunately people will ruin a good thing. Disney would do the same thing for people. And then people started uh, realizing, oh, we've got a two hour uh, wait for something and the wheelchairs are getting right in. So people would start saying, hey, I'm handicapped. If you pay me, I'll go with you to Disneyland. I'll get you to the front of all the lines. And uh, they, uh, people were literally advertising in the newspaper. I'll get you the head of any line at Walt Disney World. So then Disney stops doing it. And then the people that were legitimately handicapped were getting mad at Disney by saying, hey, you're not doing this for us anymore. So they said, well, we'll go to City Hall and you get a pass and you can get basically your equivalent of a fast pass. I mean, it was something where, again, you know, they because people got greedy, they want to make money on it. They ruined it for everybody else. It's really uh, unfortunate. And like I said, people are getting mad at Disney. But you can imagine if you were there waiting in line for two and a half hours and some guy had more money and he just paid somebody to take you up to the front of the line. That's not fair just because you're, uh, um, you know, you're, you're rich. Catherine was asked about the luminaries. Do they have any significance in the location? Yeah, they, they, they did. Um, there's a, if you go to my site, uh, worldsfairphotos.com, uh, uh, the section of the tour, there's a whole thing there about the luminaries and the miscellaneous thing. They had this struck a whole thing where you're supposed to be able to tell where you were and how to find your way to the unisphere based on the shape of the things and the colors. So around New York, they're supposed to be like the colors of the New York State, uh, you know, colors around the Vatican. It became so confusing that about a week into the fair, they stopped pretending that anybody understood the patterns or anything around it. But if you do look at certain pavilions, you can realize that the colors of the lights did complement uh, some of the pavilions that were around there. So uh, we have, there's a fellow, uh, uh, Kevin Karsh up in, um, uh, uh, he's up in the Seattle area or Portland area rather. He went and uh, measured out every street light, where they are, the size of charts. And I have all the chart on the uh, website of all the different configurations. Then we actually found a set of the blueprints for the fair where all the lights are. So between the two of them, you can look at a light and say, this is a 10 cube light in these colors. And it was here at this particular part of the fair. So we've mapped all that out to amazingly geeky, nerdy uh, uh, detail. So uh, there is a pattern, but if anybody could tell us what the pattern was, we we figured out where everything was. We just can't figure out why it was. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, it's very confusing. But uh, yeah, it is uh, it is interesting. Brock, let me unmute you here. 
You're still muted. There you go. There we go. Uh, just a quick comment. You've made comment earlier in some of the earlier presentations about the nuns that are on all the pictures around the fair. And I found it interesting. I did not notice any nuns in any of the pictures at the Vatican Pavilion. Yeah. I could have put them in there. I, I actually have a bunch of them. And you know, it's, it's, it's during this period of time that most of the nuns are still in the traditional habits. Uh, and you have the novices and the, you know, the wider ones and then the, you know, the, the walking penguin look to the others. But there were a lot of the, uh, the nuns there. And I, I remember uh, being at the uh, World's Fair. Uh, and again, uh, we went there a couple of times because my father was very proud of the small role he had in getting the Pieta over there. But I was there one time and, and somebody tapped me in the shoulder and I turned around and was one of the nuns from my Catholic school. And I damn near had a heart attack thinking, oh my God, I, I must be late for homework or something. And she says, oh, hi, Billy, nice to see you. It's like, whoa. <laughs> but yeah, they were they were there a lot. And uh, matter of fact, they had, uh, uh, they, they got front of the line privileges as you can imagine. So they uh, they had a lounge and uh, uh, they, they were, awful lot of nuns there around the pavilion because they could go in to, uh, to you know rest their feet get a cold beverage enjoy themselves but uh, i do have a bunch of pictures of nuns i just left some of them off today you know the trouble every week is poor carol knows the day before this i'm sitting here frantically trying to take thousands of pictures and figure them out uh you know how many pictures do you put of this or that or do we go for two weeks on one pavilion because some of the pavilions are they're just spectacular you know there's just so much on but you know, how much time can you spend on them? But yeah, the, the nuns love the Vatican Pavilion. Well, I'm sure they did. I just it just seemed funny that we've seen them in so many other pictures, yeah. and the pictures you happened to pick today didn't have any or didn't notice any nuns in. Yeah, you know, it's not maybe it's uh, just uh, psychological. I just stayed away from the thinking <laughs> about the, the 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 nuns. And I had some pretty good nuns, but I also had a couple that were just terrorists. I mean, you see the Blues Brothers with the nuns with the ruler and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I'm surprised my fingers, actually my brother Jim got it really bad. Uh, he, he, some of the nuns didn't take it too, too well to my brother Jim, but uh, the, yeah, the, the, the old thing about getting hit across the head with a rosary bead, all those stories that you hear, yeah, they, they were true from my point of view. Joey. Joey's gonna tell us how he took the piano home. <laughs> Joey, you should be able to go. Uh... There we go. There you go. All right. We could tell you some Catholic school stories, Bill, but we'll, <laughs> we'll leave that. Um, I, uh, many people on the site remember our friend who we lost, Richie uh, Concepcion. And um, his brother, Dennis, uh, a couple of years back, uh, laid his ashes at the site of the Philippine Pavilion. So um, Richie, Richie kind of lives on at the, uh, at the site of the Philippine Pavilion. Uh, that was one of his favorite pavilions. Yeah, yeah it's kind of a nice uh, way to, uh, to come full circle, I guess. You know, spend your eternity a place that you love. Yeah, I thought that was, that was so nice when he told us. That's another problem Disney has with trying to keep people from smuggling asses into the theme parks and spreading them around. So, you know, really? oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. A number of people in this society, you know, my brother, sister, mother, whatever, love the park so much, like just come and dump her asses, you know, into the water at Small World or around the grounds of the Haunted Mansion or, you know, hey, now they've got, you know, a thousand rather than 909 happy haunts. So yeah, they, they're very much in the look for people that are uh, uh, bringing people in. And there was one guy who was very proud that he said because of an annual pass, it took 12 times, but he finally got his brother, you know, over 12 visits uh, scattered around the park. And it's, you know, like, come on. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, Thanks. The things people do. Roy is visiting us from Maryland. There we go. Thank you for letting me steal that picture from your site for my background today. Uh, since I am from Maryland, I thought it was appropriate. But I wanted to ask you a real quick question. You mentioned BIE and concerns, uh, and I, I don't know enough about the fair, I guess, to know what you were referring to and why some countries couldn't exhibit. Could you explain that? And if it's boring for everybody else, I apologize. Oh, no, no problem at all. Uh, yeah, we're still waiting for our waffles from last week, by the way. 
But yeah, uh, BIE is the Bureau of International Exhibitions. Uh, back at the turn of the century, everybody was having a World's Fair. Uh, everybody wanted, they, they realized these were real money makers. People would come to your, your city, your country, they would spend money in hotels, that sort of thing. So all sorts of companies or countries sort of having uh, fairs. And then if you had a thing where you had two fairs close together, which one did you go to? So they formed a, a trade group, the Bureau of International Expositions. And the idea there is that they will charter world's fairs and limit how often they have them and uh, where they locate them. So you don't get two of them side by side. So the concept was, uh, for example, in 1939, you had two world's fairs in the United States. You had the official BIE sanctioned fair in New York. And then the one in San Francisco was not sanctioned by the BIE. Um, for they set up all sorts of rules that are, that are very strict. For example, your fair can go six months, not six months in a day. So for Expo 67, they didn't want to close midweek. They wanted to close on a weekend. So they had to get an exemption from the BIE to go six months and five days or whatever it was. Um, so New York managed to break almost every rule the BIE had. Um, they uh, they had had a fair in, in a BIE sanctioned fair in Seattle in 62. So they said that uh, 64 is too close to a two, two fairs in two years in the United States. We don't like that. Uh, you can't run for two seasons. You can't charge the International Pavilion's rent. Uh, a, a variety of different things. Well, Robert Moses being rather pigheaded, rather than getting together with the BIE and coming up with any sort of compromise, which probably would, could have been done, he just ran into it like a, a, a bull in a china shop and said, we're going to do it my way. And the BIE said, not with our help. So the BIE then told all its member nations that if you exhibit at this outlaw illegal New York fair, uh, we will never forget it and we'll never award a fair to your country. So most of the countries, like I mentioned, you know, uh, France at that time said, whoa, big problem. We're going to have to back out of this. Um, so they, they stopped and uh, the, very few of them, like the city of Berlin at that point did a uh, government sponsored pavilion because uh, they were trying to again, draw attention to the, uh, the, the divided city flight that they had. Uh, but a couple of places like Spain said, oh, we're really not worried. We're not having any plans of a World's Fair within our lifetime. We're worried about uh, trying to get some economic development for the Spain of today. And if the Spain of 40 years from now can't have a World's Fair, we'll, uh, we'll deal with that. So that's why Expo 67 in Montreal was a, a BIE sponsored sanctioned fair, but uh, the New York 64 fair was not. And it, it's interesting, if you go to some of the BIE pages on their website, in some cases they mention the 64 fair as not an official fair. And in other cases, they don't mention it as a, it never existed whatsoever in, in, in their eyes. It's like they annulled it, it doesn't exist. So uh, yeah, and that, that's the big thing with the BIE. So now if you wanted to have a World's Fair and people try to do it all the time, they'll come up with the idea of Minneapolis for a while I was thinking of having a World's Fair right around last year, 2020, I think was their goal. They put together a big presentation, you go over, it's just like trying to get the Olympics. You make your pitch to the BIE and then they decide to award it. And they have different classifications for a class one, two, three exhibition. And you can have an X number of uh, years apart and you know the size, that sort of thing. So uh, the US had dropped out of the BIE after the New Orleans World's Fair. Uh, they refused to pay the dues because they didn't figure they would ever participate in another World's Fair. They've recently become members so they could be uh, official in parts of Dubai and others. So, uh, you know, the, the, go look up Robert Moses and BIE and how he insulted them. He called them a bunch of old farts living in a decaying uh, you know, attic in Paris or something. And he, went, he didn't just say he didn't agree with it. He went out of his way in the New York Times to call a bunch of, you know, doting, uh, you know, old farts. And uh, they, they came out of the shoot uh, in, in revenge. So... That's why our beloved World's Fair is a World's Fair to us, not to the BIE. So hope that helps. 
That was a great explanation. And I also wanted to compliment you on your uh, wonderful sort of uh, droll, slightly snarky delivery on some of the slides like the uh, the, the picnic tables set up outside of the uh, buffet area, which weren't very attractive. It, it, uh, I laughed so much during this presentation and, and I thank you for your wonderful delivery. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, to me, what gets me and stuff like that, it would have been so easy to do it right. You know, it's so, it, it, it's, it's, I guess, like the, the years of working in entertainment, you know, you have one chance to get it right and, and you did what, you know, so you have, you know, some of these things and how could people think that was acceptable? That's just the stuff that kind of amazes me at, at looking at it. And again, I, I love the World's Fair. I, I had got, this is the first fair I had gone to. And, you know, it's, it's, people say, which is your favorite? It's like, you know, you remember the first girl you kissed or whatever. Well, this fair I love, and I've been to a bunch of others, and I, despite its warts, I still absolutely adore the 64, 65 World's Fair. Uh, and they end up with a lot of problems. I mean, you know, financially, they had a, a you know, tremendous problem, you know, uh, you know, that they had overspent, the revenues weren't there, but for the most part, they kept the grounds looking really nice. The flowers, uh, they did a really great job, uh, you know, throughout them right up to the very end of, you know, uh, planting some things like that. So it's just when you see uh, the maintenance sort of stuff, they started cutting back on trash collection and things like that. And the, the last couple of days of the, uh, the fair, when we get to that in two weeks from now, it was really a, a shame that there were so many people coming, but they had cut back, oh, we don't need trash collectors. Well, yeah, you didn't, you know, we got rid of the trash collectors when you were having 30,000 people a day come, but now you're having 300,000 people a day come you should have hired a few people back. And that's the sort of warts that they, uh, you know, that they, they kind of made some mistakes on that. When you're 12 years old, 13 years old, you're looking around and it didn't seem right then, it doesn't seem right now. So, well, I'm glad to know that somebody that appreciates my sense of humor. <laughs> my kids don't. Jason, you had your hand up. There you go. There we are. Um, Bill, uh, as far as the uh, what was in the international pavilions in 64, 65 compared to what's in there today, is it is it a lot different? Is it a lot more, a lot less? Um, well, for most of the fairs today, uh, it, it's you have a lot more government participation uh, other than the U.S. Uh, the U.S. still tends to be uh, driven by uh, uh, companies. So when I've gone to other World's Fairs, you have more done by the government and less of a hard sell by the industry. But like everybody else, industry does get its foot in there because they have the money to go in it. But uh, a lot more of the pavilions are done with a uh, uh, look at the culture of the, the country, uh, which is what I enjoy. If I go there, I really don't care if you're really good at making transistor radios or not but I love to see pictures of your waterfalls or your folk dancers or that sort of thing. And that's what to me has been really lacking in US pavilions uh, in recent years is that, as I mentioned, the BIE, the US dropped out of the BIE was not a dues paying member. So for most of the pavilions that you would go to in recent world's fairs, they were all done by uh, American companies. I mentioned, for example, going to Expo 85, and you would have thought you were at the Texas Instruments Pavilion as opposed to the US Pavilion. I mean, next to nothing that would make you say, wow, I want to go visit America. You might want to say, I want to go buy a calculator. And even you had uh, you know, the recent one in China, you know, they decided the US would participate, but the government refused to allocate any money to it. So Hillary Clinton had to run out and try to get people to uh, participate. So you had a giant display by Coca-Cola another giant display, but I think it was Nike and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll throw you, you know, here's a, a snippet of culture and a, a giant bucket of, uh, you know, commercialism. And that to me has been disappointing. I mean, in, in a number of countries or fairs I've gone to, you know, people have asked, oh, are you from America? I've almost wanted to say, no, Canada, because their pavilions have generally been really, really interesting. And ours in recent fairs have been it's, it's just really lackluster. So, uh, and it's interesting, Dubai, you know, they had a pushback from last year to this year because of the pandemic. And uh, evidently they're getting hit harder than hell by the pandemic right now. So whether or not they're gonna be able to open this year or not is, is gonna be a real interesting conundrum. So 
Uh, I don't know when the next World's Fair will be. Uh, you know, that one will open this year or, or what's coming up after that. But um, I've gotten less interested in going to fairs as time goes on as they've gotten more commercial. And somebody mentioned they had uh, new to World's Fair. Is a bit familiar with Expo 70 that took place in Japan, you know, in Osaka. Uh, I'll be doing that in a couple weeks. I, I'm not a real expert on Expo 70, but uh, I'm going to try to putz my way through it. So uh, it had some great architecture, and U.S. had a very popular pavilion there showing moon rocks and stuff. So we'll try to hit that in a, in a few weeks. Anyone else? Uh, Gary? Okay. Gary, live from the upper level of the New York State Pavilion. There we go. I think I got it. Yes, you do. Um, uh, well, I lost my train of thought now, but two comments. Uh, first of all, Spain, uh, their tourist office was always on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. And they had a lot of tie-ins before and for many years after the fair directly with um, uh, with uh, exhibits and so on and so forth. So you could actually go into their office on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan and check out what was going on at the fair or get some freebies or cross plug things of that nature. Uh, yeah, somewhere I have a picture uh, in my New York City collection of their office and a uh, display in the window uh, about that. So yeah, thanks for right. that. One other comment, Bill, uh, I wanted to put a little plug in for you. What I enjoy most about these uh, uh, Zoom get togethers, uh, using your pictures mostly, I think you concentrate on using your own pictures. Right. Um, is for me, it's able to see all of the interiors of the pavilions. And you don't see that a lot if you go online and so on and so forth. I know you have in your collections uh, that you make available, but uh, to me, that's the plus is to see what was inside, whether it was good or bad, but that also brings back memories as most people just know the buildings, they know General Motors, they know IBM, et cetera. But when you see what all the exhibits were, especially in the, uh, international area, uh, it sort of comes together a little bit more for me. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, it was interesting. Jim Brown sent out an email yesterday and appreciate you doing that, Jim, the people were saying, hey, come to Bill's talk and the international area is not one of our favorites, but you know, there were some fun things on it. And that's, to me, again, the, the interiors of these things are uh, interesting. Um, I, I was just yesterday, um, I have a uh, you know, shameless plug, my next book coming out on the uh, 1939 uh, San Francisco World's Fair. It comes out on May 10th. And I just got the most recent set of revised proofs yesterday from the uh, publisher. So I was going through them last night. And again, the, the pictures that people took uh, back inside of these things, uh, I, I could come up with all sorts of pictures that people took, uh, you know, the, the, the companies took of their exhibits, but I figure out, you know, everybody can go find those online. They were in some public library that scanned them or whatever. But uh, to me, it's the stuff that the people took because film was so expensive that if somebody actually thought enough to take a picture of the gift shop in the Philippines pavilion, you know, that can make it kind of special to somebody. So let's go see something that we're not likely to, uh, to go see. So uh, we were just chatting on, on the uh, Facebook page yesterday about uh, uh, any, how many people are familiar with half frame cameras? It was a, a, a matter of fact, I got a bunch of the slides right here. I'll pick up two slides. Um, you have a standard 35 mil millimeter slide and you have a half frame slide. And then that's, I don't know if people can see it too well, but the half frame is actually, as it says, is half the visual image of the, uh, uh, the 35 millimeter slide. And what it did was it took a roll of 35 millimeter film, but it took half of you know, the image for each picture. So they end up being a lot smaller than the, uh, the, the 35 millimeters. But again, it was a way when film was so expensive, now I can get twice as many pictures on a roll. And so if I got a 12 exposure roll, it became a 24 exposure roll. And to me, again, that's the sort of stuff that, you know, today with digital cameras, you know, 
I look at my own, my God, how many pictures I have of my dog, you know, I mean, oh, here's my dog lying cute on the rug. Here's my do dog cute on the couch. Oh, here's the dog cute in the backyard. You know, if it was costing me a buck 50 every time I had to take one of those pictures, you know, I, I probably would have cut down a number of them, but hey, I can have it. That, you know, someday we do a thousand pictures of our each of our dogs. Uh, but back then, film was expensive, you know, and uh, it was, you know, you had to carry it with you. You had to get it developed. So that's what, yeah, I try to go for the stuff that's a little off the, the beaten path. I appreciate uh, your, your mentioning it. Yeah, Glenn mentioned the Kodak 110. Oh, God, horrible camera. <laughs> I mean, you know, Kodak over time, I mean, Kodak, they did some really wonderful things, but the Kodak 110, the images next to it, and, and it's horrible. I'm trying to blow up anything on that. And then they did for a while and they got themselves sued over it. The little wheel uh, things they had done where you could get the Kodak images on a, a stupid little wheel. Uh, I mean, just, you know, make the camera smaller and smaller, but the images were so terrible that if you wanted anything other than a three by five or maybe a four by six, uh, they were just terrible. Beth, you have a picture from every single day of your kids' lives. That's cool. That's neat. You know, uh, it, it's funny in my family, I, I like to uh, talk about, you know, I, I theoretically had mother, father, and five boys in the family. For the most of it, you would figure there was a mother, father, and four boys in the family because I was the one taking all the pictures. My <laughs> mother and father had very little interest in cameras whatsoever. So I was taking pictures. And over time, you know, you start looking and you say, you know, oh my god my, my cousin took a picture of our family it, it's very rare that we actually have the seven of us all together in pictures but uh anita every single day of the kids the kids must love that no i bet, bet not yeah the kodak disc camera t oh yeah they were terrible they were just uh, and i think i bought one for carol we took two or three rolls of it and just and then they got sued and they weren't able to sell it anymore they infringed on the somebody else's uh, uh, format. So then Kodak did that a couple of times. They came up with different things, stole them. Um, and I mean, the, the, there was another one, was it EPS or APS, Advanced Photo System. Another thing, you just take a cartridge, stick it in, it'll automatically wind, and then good luck ever doing anything again with it. So, you know, there were all these different formats that came up with time. And I, I still have my old Polaroid cameras. You can't buy film for anymore. And, you know, just all sorts of stuff. I, like my Canon AE-1, I cannot remember the last time I shot a roll of film on that, but I've shot thousands of rolls around the world with it. It's like, you know, do you sell your brother? You know, in some cases you might want to, but my AE-1 sits there and made sure I took the battery out so it doesn't rot away. And, you know, and now you can probably even find batteries for them because, oh, it's a mercury battery and they kill people. So <laughs> you get all this antique camera gear you can't use anymore. Wayne, let me unmute you here. There you go. Uh, uh, talking about the uh, commercial aspects of the fair, uh, one of the interesting things to me is the map companies that uh, made uh, versions of maps with the uh, imprint of various companies that actually weren't at the fair, but maybe had a facility in Manhattan. Uh, I have one that's from Zenith Radio Corporation, had a showroom. And another one uh, that was interesting was a uh, exporting firm that uh, offered to uh, supply American-made goods and ship them to your uh, country for foreign visitors. Yeah, if there was any way that you could tie your, your company into the fair, and particularly if you didn't need to do with the expense of building a pavilion, so much the better. And that's why so many companies went to things like we saw Colgate Pomala. Yeah. You know, they didn't have the Colgate pavilion at the fair, but if you can go and put a booth in somebody else's pavilion, everybody that walked into Malaysia that particular day got the word Colgate Pomala stuck in their brain for at least a nanosecond for you know very little price so uh, and then you know there's so many ads if you go through the magazines from the uh uh you know or newspapers of the, the days of the 64 fair people when you're going to go to the world's fair your feet are going to get tired but if you wear shoes from so and such you'll your your feet will come out great 
So he had no participation in the fair. You, you get some artists to do some generic vine art for the unisphere in there. And now you've just tied in your brand of your comfy, cozy Tomacan shoes or something to the, uh, to the fair. Get to you in one second, Dave. Uh, Glenn Barker mentioned a Minox B. My father brought home the camera. The, they made the, uh, uh, I've got a whole bunch of them here. The, they, they made the half frame uh, film look big. But yeah, it was James Bond and my dad worked for a Japanese company. So every time there's something new coming out in Japan, they came up with samples and stuff. And he had the little Minox and my brother took it to a Philmont Scout Reservation with us. And he'd open it up, take the picture, slide it back together. It was really neat. It was real. I mean, the whole camera was about like the size of this remote control here. The trouble was it took horrible, tiny little pictures. And I've got all these pictures I'm trying to restore of my brothers, you know, for us standing at the front of the house at Easter, all dressed up, getting ready to go to church and that. And they're great memories. I don't know about you, Glenn. Have you tried to do anything to restore any of yours or, or do anything with them? They're just so gosh darn small. You should be able to unmute. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I haven't. I've got the original uh, photos. They were all black and white back then that I used and I had my own dark room. So I was able to develop them and blow them up and make pretty good shots. We went on a trip with our youth band and I took a lot of pictures of all the kids and ended up making copies and selling them back to the kids. So, but it was a lot of fun camera. It was beautifully built. Well, the, uh, here, let me just grab something real quick. Um, share screen. <laughs> This is the sort of image quality you get out of yours truly you get standing on the front lawn for Easter day. I mean, no sharpness, no definition whatsoever, but we uh, visit my mom and her Easter best or whatever. So they were cute little novelty cameras, but uh, you know, my, my, uh, every Easter I stick these on Facebook to embarrass the hell out of my brothers. But uh, yeah, my, bro my brother just loved running around with his Minox camera. I think he <laughs> Time or something the whole time. Which, which one was you in that photo with the three kids? I was the first one, that guy squinting. I had very blue eyes and I, I'm just horrible in sunset. I mean, uh, light. So yeah, if we go back here. Okay, so it's my brother Jerry, uh, Kevin, Ed, and there's me. So uh, just so That's you. to be there. So yeah, this is again, just Easter house. I think it was around, I had to look up the year at the, the Cotter family. So my, my dad, this is my brother. You're about, yeah, you're about eight or 10 years old then, I guess. Uh, let's see if I can see which year this was. One second here. Uh, the, the tall kid in the middle with the red jacket? Yeah, uh, the tall kid in the middle is, oh, let's see. Uh, the, the one, in, that's Jerry's. So I'm on the, uh, the top right. With the uh, checkered jacket, Jim's off to the side, oh, Jim's okay. in the middle. My brother uh, Kevin, which I still kid him about the hat, and then Ed uh, in the, the red. So let's see, what year was this? Uh, this was. I guess you're about twelve years, years older. Six. So I was uh, a whopping fourteen years old at the time. What year was that? Sixty-six. 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 Yeah. And then, uh, like I said, I've ended up with all the family photos and those take forever to restore because they're so small and a piece of dust, you know, on a 35 millimeter, a little piece of dust is over here. On one of these, the piece of dust just covers so much more. So, yeah. hey, it's good memories. Dave, you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, I wanted to ask you um, a World's Fair question, but before that, so one of the things about digital photography is uh, when you get your camera, whatever brand or size, or you decide how you're going, how you're going to set the defaults in terms of the resolution of the images. And I typically set it as high as the camera will do with the least amount of compression, yada, 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 because let's say you've taken this just spectacular photo and you want to have it printed to 16 by 20. Well, if you set your resolution down low, you yep. didn't capture it. So it, it, the downside of that, of course, is when you try to mail this picture to a friend, it's big and um, maybe too big to, to, for an email program. Cameras are getting better. 
I take a lot of stuff with my iPhone 11 Pro and those pictures are, I mean, that's, it's amazing what you can do with that file size, but yeah. it's not like the image that I get out of my Nikon full frame SLR. It just isn't. So it's the trade-off that you have. Luckily you don't, but you still have the, instead of having film and um, 36 frames, now you have a memory card and the bigger the memory card you put in, you can take more pictures, but I typically don't use anything bigger than 16 gig because if the memory card gets broken or for some reason you can't upload the images, you don't want, and I don't want an, a you know, 256 gig card that I never have to change, that I never copy over. So in any case, I think there's always, you, you got, I just try to assume I might just get lucky and take this fantastic picture and I'll want to blow it up and I need to have the information there to do that. And you can always downsize it, but you can't upsize it. Well, it's interesting you mentioned I had this, uh, it's here is a genuine Nikon compact flash from one of my first digital Nikons, a whopping eight megabytes uh, card here. And I have some ones. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's fine, ones. yeah. One, I, yes, I have a two and a four, but I happen to have I have whole bags of these things sitting here. Uh, but, so uh, I, I made the mistake when I first got the camera, thinking, "Oh, I'll just dial down everything so I could fit more on it." So I was doing the digital version of half frame pictures. Yep. Now I yeah. look back and go, "You idiot! You're never going to go back there." You know, right. But again, this stuff was expensive, you know. And right. right. You know, now you look and you say, "Well, here I've got you know, uh, you know." Others, yeah, there's Glenn's disc, five and a quarter, I think, right? Yeah, I think five and a quarter. Camera, the one in my camera today is a 32 gigabyte, you know, and, uh, you know, yeah. change. So, Harold? So, uh, World's, Fair, oh, World's Fair question. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I know, oh, okay. I know that you, we talked about in one of these programs, we talked about Mr. Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And, but when I'm maybe just, I'm having a senior moment. But it doesn't seem like we did much about that pavilion and the show and the context in which it was done. Yeah, the big it was from from Illinois Pavilion, right? Yeah, did that a couple of weeks ago. The big reason for that is they had a prohibition about flash photography, which uh, mentioned back then people actually paid attention to the rules. So uh, you, you came in and you had uh, the pre-show. You know, uh, you can hear it on the. Uh, the Disney uh, CDs uh, uh, or uh, yeah, the CDs and that. But for the show itself, uh, I've got probably half a dozen pictures of Lincoln and they all suck because, you know, lighting was horrible. Uh, the figure was a bit of a distance away from the audience. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me, not a lot of great, uh, great pictures of it. I, you know, again, even Disney, when they try to find good pictures of it, they end up using them from Disneyland for the most part because uh, they didn't keep any, any good ones. So I talked about it, but uh, that's where we talk about Lincoln uh, having his uh, fit with his uh, yeah. problem with the electric- Breaking the chair, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> so me. it was popular, yes? Oh, it was super popular. Uh, the, uh, excuse me, the lines were, were uh, insane. Uh, from the very beginning, it was uh, very popular. And then they were trying to figure out with the show, do we shorten the show and fit more in there per day? Uh, you know, what we can do with that. So I think they actually did do some trimming of it between the, the seasons to try to put one more show a day or something in. But uh, it, was a, it was a huge hit at the fair. And um, again, that's why they rushed the Lincoln Mark II into production so they could have him out at Disneyland in the Opera House. So he was performing at the, the, the two, uh, you know, coast. Uh, you know, the original thing was he was going to be just at the, you know, the fair for the uh, year, the two years, then bring him back and put him in a Disneyland. Well, they decided that they had made so many advances in AA figures within a year from all the things they realized what they had done wrong on Lincoln Mark I that they built Lincoln Mark II and then put him out of Disneyland and realized it didn't cannibalize the show issue. And they, there were some arguments between Disney and the state of Illinois about going ahead and putting uh, Lincoln in a Disneyland in 65 because nobody's going to come and see our show in New York. And they said, trust mm -hmm. us, the attendance won't go down. And luckily it didn't. So the lawyers didn't have to get involved. Well, and I do want to thank, I'm sorry. 
it was basically filled with capacity for almost every time that I can recall. Wow. I do want to just tell you how terrific these programs are. And pandemic or not, um, I'd still give up part of my Saturday to just because I'm I'm learning so much and it's great for the other people that are know much more about World Fairs than I that I'm I'm you know get it's like wow it's a whole new world seems like that's from a movie but <laughs> so like, Carol and thank I, you for doing it if all goes well next uh, Thursday at 5 15 I get my second uh, COVID vaccination shot so after that you'll never see me again because I'm going to be up <laughs> on all these places and all the backgrounds of all your pictures yeah good luck with that yeah thank you oh sure I appreciate it uh Harold let me uh, unmute you here there okay you go. thanks Bill sure. uh, just listening and uh, watching from Toronto, Canada. And I just wanted to give some more background about the BIE and the awarding of exhibitions of expos. Sure. But, um, Expo 67 was originally awarded to Moscow. Yeah. And it was in 1960 that the BIE had their competition for the 1967 fair. The Soviet Union wanted to mark the 50th anniversary of the revolution. 1917 revolution, Canada wanted to honor the 100th anniversary or centennial of Canada becoming a country. And the vote on the BIE, Moscow won by one vote. And so they awarded the Expo 67 to Moscow. And then two years later, Moscow did some more thinking about it. And they either decided it was too expensive or maybe they didn't have enough security people to watch over millions of tourists flooding into the Soviet Union. They withdrew their bid. And then the BIE came back to Montreal and said, do you want to hold it? And Montreal did accept it, but they only had five years. It was 1962, they were awarded the fair for 67. They had only five years and one year was spent just building the site that it was uh, one completely new island in the middle of the St. Lawrence River and another island was doubled in size. So just getting your site prepared, very much like the uh, 3940 World's Fair uh, when they had to prepare Flushing Meadows Park, that, that I understood took about a year getting that old garbage dump, that old yeah. ash uh, area prepared. But here again, you know, it was a case that uh, there was a lot of doubt in Canada that can we get it done in five years? And luckily they made it just under the wire and it turned out to have 50 million visitors when they were expecting maybe 30 before. So uh, there's the power of the BIE and their decision was like awarding the Olympics. Yeah, the uh, interesting thing was, you know, you didn't hear much about the Montreal World's Fair at all in New York. Everything was about, you know, uh, New York World's Fair, World's Fair, and then World's Fair ended. Uh, there was next to no talk at all in the New York City area about Expo 67. It was a real surprise. So I, I ended up uh, going up to uh, Expo 67 and was like, wow, this is a pretty neat spot. And then... Um, uh, I talked about this when I did the Expo 67 talk a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, went to the World's Fair, enjoyed it, and then left. And then uh, back in 1969, I go to college uh, upstate New York, not far away from uh, the Canadian border, right near the Cornwall border crossing. Right, so yeah. a bunch of us decided to drive up to Montreal and go see what it was like. My dad, as I mentioned, was an international shipping company. And he had a, a fellow, uh, Wally had an office up there and he invited us to come up to his curling club, which was great fun. And we went up and all of a sudden I looked across the river and there's Expo 67, it's still there. It's, it's like, this is two years later, what are you doing there? So, you know, I found out they had reopened it as man in this world. And uh, exactly. uh, it's, it, as a matter of fact, uh, let me just pull it up here real quick, uh, share screen. Uh, Shameless plug for my book, um, you know, I did on Expo 67. Uh, God, it's hard to leave. Came out five years ago? Oh my God, where's time gone? But I have a whole chapter in there on uh, Man in His World and how, you know, the World's Fair that was supposed to last for six months, which they had done in the BIE auspices, and they got, you know, six months and four days or whatever it was, that uh, this is the sort of thing Moses could have done. And actually, they did it in 39. The 39 World's Fair was always announced as the 1939, New York 1939 World's Fair. It was never announced as the 1939, 1940 World's Fair. So you get the BIE to say, uh, yeah, we'll let you do a World's Fair for six months. 
And all the contracts are basically nudge, nudge, wink, wink, if we happen to still stay around for 1940. So that's why all the merchandise is the 1939 World's Fair or the 1940 World's Fair, because they were done as two separate World's Fairs that happened to be in the same spot in the same buildings, but they were two different legal organizations. And Moses could have done that. He could have worked it out. He could have come up with something, but nobody ever said no to him in his life. And he just, he, you know, I mean, I admire a lot of what he did, but he was just butthead stupid with the BIE. I mean, he really was. But Expo 67, a wonderful thing. Uh, I, I went there, like I said, uh, you know, uh, enjoyed it. Uh, came back two years later. I was astonished it was there. And then for the four years I was in college up there, we try to go up each year and see it. And it was, it was mind numbing because the US pavilion this year would be the uh, Sweden pavilion or the uh, Scandinavian mm -hmm. pavilion that year, but the telephone pavilion was now the US pavilion, but the US pavilion went back this year to where it was four years ago. I mean, mm -hmm. you definitely had to buy a map to figure out where you were going from year to year, uh, but it was a spectacular thing. And we were just back in Montreal a couple of years ago, and you can still have the biosphere there. Uh, you still have the little Rond uh, amusement area. So uh, we love going. And then you can go uh, to the uh, well, former French Pavilion, which is now a casino. Yes, and yes. Uh, we went in there, and, and I was happy. I, I don't think I came out losing maybe a dollar or something, uh, you know, compared to what I, I could have lost. But it was just, you know, phenomenal to go back and just think about when you're 15 years old and back at Expo, you know, Expo 67, great, yes. uh, great fair. Yeah, so if anybody wants to take a trip back, uh, a second visit to Expo 67, let me know, we can do that. We can, I can focus more on the man in the world, you know, uh, hodgepodge of the, the changing events. Sure, that sounds wonderful. Yeah, I do an annual pilgrimage to Montreal and always visit the old Expo site every time, spend at least a day or two there, just wandering around. It's, it's phenomenal if anybody gets a chance. And now they're just putting the money forward to redo the place uh, of nations, the uh, center court yes. or the uh, uh, flame was and everything. And it, the last one was really ceremony. bad to go see all the beams falling down, but they're, they're restoring and putting it, some of it back. But they've done some really nice stuff on that site. And it's uh, just, a, a, Montreal is one of my favorite, favorite cities. And Carol speaks enough French that she can get us by. So, <laughs> so, so what? What was the reaction of the BIE when they decided at the end of the fair not to tear it down and reopen it again for another season? Didn't no, kind of annoy the BIE? It didn't didn't react to anything. You know, Canada wasn't uh, saying that they were planning any other World Fairs. Didn't put anything in the jeopardy. And they had really intended to tear it down. It was really built as a six month fair. They hadn't done a lot of the things that New York had done with, you know, again, the nudge, nudge, wink, wink. They had planned Expo 67. But as Harold mentioned, the attendance was just phenomenal. People just kept coming and coming and coming and it was packed. And then the mayor uh, of Montreal at that time said, hey, you know, it's going to cost a bunch of money for you to tear down your pavilion. How would you like to just donate it to the city of Montreal? So he got the massive amount and he had a lot of political pressure that a lot of his uh, other politicians did not agree with him. They did not want to get stuck with the cost of tearing this down themselves. And he said, no, we don't need to tear it down. We can operate and do this. And when they reopened in, in 68, uh, a tremendous percentage, like 90% of, uh, or something of the exhibitors came back again, but now their pavilions are being run by the city of, of Montreal. So, uh, you know, France was still there and uh, all the Soviet bloc uh, countries picked up their, their uh, pavilions disassembled them and took them home for the most part. Uh, but, but of course, uh, in '68 they didn't call it a World's Fair, though. No, no, it was it was no longer, and it wasn't even called uh, Expo '68. Uh, it was called Man in His World. They changed the name, but there was no blowback from the BIE that I particularly uh, ever ever heard of. And uh, again, very popular. Um, there were there were, they had some great shows. You know, the, the Circle Vision show stayed there for a number of years and. Uh, it was a great thing. I, I mentioned, I went there one time and you, you know, you see how things recycle. I was there one time and there was, they had a, a trash, I mentioned last week, I loved the, the psycho or a psycho uh, robot that, you know, walked around the guy with the remote control. Well, I went to Man in This World and they had a trash can and they would follow people and bump them and people would turn around and they'd look and, you know, who hit me? And there was a trash can there. And then 
they would go down the road and the trash can would bump them again. They turn around, not realizing this trash can's following them around. And then he had a speaker inside. That guy said something like, are you going to finish that ice cream or can I have it? And the people would just die because it's, you know, this thing had done it. Well, 20, 30 years later, Disney came up with a talking trash can robot. It was like, I'm convinced somebody else had been at, at, at you know, Man of His World. But I remember just sitting on the bench watching the guy, and he's sitting there very, uh, you know, circumspect with his control in his hand. He's just following him around a little microphone, and he's, you know, talking to people. And nobody trying to figure out, who, you know, where this is being done from. It, it, was, it was a great gimmick. I really just, for being you know, a people watching thing, it was that sort of thing. I must have spent an hour just watching this trash can chase people around. I'm hungry. Give me that soda. <laughs> it was a great gimmick. Just... You know, and that's the sort of thing I like because, again, it's silliness. It costs money for somebody to build that. It costs some money to operate it. Nobody went there buying a ticket to go see the talking trash can, but it's the sort of thing that adds in the extra uh, entertainment value. And that's, again, for a shameless Disney plug, I think that's what's made the Disney park so successful over the years is all the little plussing of things that, you know, you come in, there's a little extra thing here, a little, I mean, like the Indiana Jones Q ride line, all sorts of things. Do not pull rope and you pull the rope and you hear you know things exploding and collapsing and stuff but you know it's it's, it's the great fun of stuff so for next week assuming that i uh, survive my second shot i'm going to be taking a look at the 64 world's fair uh uh at night uh well, the 64 65 world's fair since uh, Robert moses had given them the finger but at night was one of my favorite times. The uh, the crowds were down, the heat was down. Uh, you know, uh, Carlos was pointing the uh, fountains of the fairs behind him. It was really a spectacular uh, time to go to the fair at night. And I mentioned earlier, some of the pavilions like the uh, uh, Thailand pavilion looked nights during the day at night. You'd really swear you were an Angkor Wat. You know, I mean, the, the way these things were lit up and everything, you lose so much of the surrounding cityscape or the uh, you know the infrastructure of the fair behind you and, and they really went way out of their way for lighting designs on uh, pavilions so even if you had a relatively minor pavilion like the Philippines I mentioned is really nice design and everything at night it just blows you away the, the 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 lighting architects for the 64 65 fair did a phenomenal job and uh, like I said I, I liked it from a photography point of view uh, I, I I don't even know if I owned a tripod back then, but you got really good by putting a camera on top of a trash can or a water fountain or something to try to get some uh, stability to it. And uh, you get end up and you get a lot of ghost images of people blurring by the pictures, that sort of thing. But the pavilions were uh, really, really spectacular. So, uh, and I did get a kick of the chat here that Tom was mentioning about having artists paint your kids every day. <laughs> Yeah, that would have been a challenge for you, you Beth, of uh, having everybody, uh, everybody being able to do that. So, uh, well, Carlos, you went to Expo 67 with your Explorer post. What post was that? I was 348. Okay, and where city were you out of? We were out of, um, oh, geez, I guess I'm trying to remember now, but we were, uh, comprised mostly of uh, camp staff, uh, you know, people, right. order the arrow people. So we were from all over uh, the island. Yeah, I've been uh, 179 out of uh, Baldwin. So uh, yeah, we, we had, uh, the, the, for the people who aren't familiar with the Explorer Scouts or the older part of Boy Scouts, and I enjoyed getting into it because they took us to places like, oh, let's go to the Brooklyn Navy Yard and let's go on a U.S. destroyer and all the things you couldn't take the 11 year old kids. You could now do that. We were 15, 16, 17. It was great fun. But we didn't get to go to Expo 67. So, well, any other questions? Again, appreciate everybody joining and thanks for the kind words from folks at the. Uh, Appreciates it when I'm sitting here trying to figure out why on earth am I doing this on a Friday when I should be doing other things. I like I, I should be working like Boy Scout patch collection, which you'll appreciate, Carlos. I'm scanning all my patches and everything. I've got to realize how many of these damn things I have. I, I, I have a site on our Boy Scout camp that Carlos and I both worked at. And uh, just like pictures, uh, I, I had taken all these patches over the years, scanned them, stuck them on the website. But back when disk space was really expensive, so I had all these really small pictures of all the patches. 
and I decided recently I've got to make it web friendly, uh, mobile device friendly. I'm going to rescan all the patches. I didn't realize that I have over 3,000 patches from our damn Boy Scout camp. And at five minutes or so, per, you know, thing to you know, uh, scan it, crop it, size it, and everything. And my ISP is going to love it when I upload them all. But you know, it's uh, it's it is fun. So uh, I'll be doing that. So. Again, thanks everybody. Appreciate uh, everybody yeah. joining and uh, look forward to, to seeing you next week. Okay, thanks. See you next Thursday. Great. See, See you next week. Thanks, Carol. Take care. Bye.